Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And we are going back to 1999. A magical year, as far as I'm concerned. You got the music in you. Technically, it was released right at the end of 1998, but I will always associate it with 99, which has taken on this idyllic sheen in my memory. Just an endless beach party of a year with summer jam after summer jam delivered in bright, saturated colors. And it might seem more special to me personally because that was the year I officially started paying attention to pop music after a childhood of cultural isolation. So when that song, that one song came on, it was like it was speaking to me personally. Oh, I did wake up. You Get What You Give by The New Radicals was either the first or the second music video I ever saw on MTV. At the time, it got lost in the shuffle of a billion other songs I was absorbing for the first time, but the memory has always lingered with me, and that seems to be true for most people. It was never much of a chart success. It peaked in the early weeks of that year, just barely inside the top 40. Yet it's one of those songs everyone remembers. And if you don't like this song, I advise you to click away now, because I'm just going to gush over it the entire time. I think it's one of the best songs of the 90s. It is one of the few songs that can make me dance, and I don't dance. In fact, it's only grown more and more acclaimed as the years go by. The Edge said he was jealous of it. Joni Mitchell called it the only song in decades that really excited her. YouTube star Todd in the Shadows called it one of the best songs of the 90s. I mean, I think the most pop record I used to really like uh, was a song by the New Radicals called uh, Don't Give Up. Now that's an endorsement. And despite its many celebrity fans, I still feel like it's never gotten its due. If it had been part of some trend or genre like grunge that writers like to mythologize, or if the band had gone on to bigger and better things, maybe it would be near the top of all those greatest ever lists. But alone it stands. Well, that's what I exist for. So come, let us reflect on the brief and strange career of the New Radicals, who told us all we had a reason to live, but were themselves just too new and too radical to live for very long beyond their single masterpiece. Just don't be afraid to leave. So once upon a time, there was a Michigan teenager named Greg Alexander, with two G's, Greg Gugu. In 1989, he sent a letter to A&M Records saying, hey, you should sign me, and they did. His first album got zero promotion because of internal reshuffling in the label, and it's pretty hard to find now, but most of it got recycled into his second album in 1992, which got a bigger push. It is titled Intoxifornication. That's the title. Here's the first single released off of it, Smokin' In Bed. What is this? Uh, Mr. Alexander, I really, really hope you're not watching this video because uh, I have to do my duty as an honest critic here and say this is pretty bad. Yeah, 1992 was one of those years where rock was clearly changing, but it wasn't clear yet into what. I'm not sure what Greg's going for here, because this is a kind of 90s cool that only existed for like half a second. Some kind of horrible mix of Prince, 90s U2, NXS, and Jesus Jones. Yeah, sounds like he and his producers took a big swing on the sound of the 90s being the Soup Dragons, and uh, yeah, that didn't really pan out. Uh, here's another video he made, titled The Truth. I am a Jew, a Jew. I think maybe banking on Greg Alexander's boyish sex appeal was also a mistake. Like, what if Beck thought he was Jim Morrison? Well, now you know. Here comes, here comes the lawsuit, baby! Slow ride. Take it easy! Okay. Uh, for what it's worth, I don't think he got sued. I don't think Fogg had even noticed. In my burial ditch, ditch. So yeah, this is all extremely bad, but it's bad in a weird and unexpected way, and you can work with that. A little tweaking, and if he wasn't trying so hard to be cool, he could have been the next alt-rock star of the 90s, because the 90s were about to be very good for weird outsiders. But t'was not to be. But it wasn't a total loss. It was during that album that he worked with a backup singer named Danielle Brisebois. 
You've probably seen this delightful little girl. Her name is Danielle Brisbois. Brisbois was already famous as a child actress. She came in as Archie Bunker's niece on the final season of All in the Family after Gloria and Meathead left. And she stayed on during the spinoff. Goodbye, little sweetheart. <laughs> I'm going to guess this is not revered as particularly classic television. Just give us a sound, when she reached adulthood, she devoted herself entirely to music. Alexander produced her debut album in 1994, and they had some extremely minor success with that. And Alexander was still finding work, he sold a couple songs here and there. And then the two of them started a band. Alexander, Brisebois, and a rotating list of nameless randos. And they gave themselves a laughably pretentious name. Next, one of the acts widely touted to be the next big thing. I'm sure that won't stop them. New Radicals. In November 1998, the New Radicals released their first album, Maybe You've Been Brainwashed Too. Greg Alexander was no longer a shaggy-haired, scrawny, wannabe sex god, but a bald t-shirt wearing hipster, a look that fit him a lot better. The first single, You Get What You Give, peaked in late January at Billboard number 36, which seems way too low to me. Then, as always, Billboard's methodology is questionable. I refuse to believe it was that much less popular than the country version of I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. But it's the only measurement we have. You Get What You Give is kind of a unique song. It's kind of hard for me to put it in context because there's not really any other songs like it. But if you look at 1999, it does start to make a kind of sense. When alt rock broke through in 1992-ish, it seemed like music just wanted to mope all goddamn day. And then all of a sudden, people started cheering up. I get no what did we have to be unhappy about? The Cold War was over. Nuclear war wasn't looming over us. The economy was good. So all of a sudden, Smashing Pumpkins were out. Smash Mouth was in. But it all still had that Gen X ironic edge to it. Like, these are all extremely literate songs. There's a lot of words in them. And some of them are actually really clever. Or they're trying to be, even if they aren't. Even a lot of the happy songs feel a little sarcastic. Because the 90s generation, they were just too cool. They had it all figured out. They were self-aware about everything. Their movies were about movies. Their rock stars hated being rock stars. Watching, everybody that's watching this world, this world is bullshit. So You Get What You Give is one of the few moments of what I would call hipster optimism. Some sunny sincerity for the ironic detachment crowd. If you just looked at the chorus alone, it would seem super corny. But the verses actually make this song a lot saltier than it seems. This song pretty much agrees with Fiona Apple up there. This world is bullshit. But he also has one real insight here. Being too good and too smart to buy into the phoniness of the world feels pretty fantastic. Alexander wrote it while he and most people he knew were broke and couch surfing through life. And when you look at it, there is something really awesome and romantic about it. Like mostly what I get from this song is that sense of being in your 20s and having nothing figured out and everything figured out at the same time. You got the music in you. Nothing can get you down. The future is good even if the present is a mess. Like so what the world is bullshit. You are still awesome. You'll be okay. Follow your heart. It feels like this song could only have been written in the late 90s when the news of the world was mostly funny and it didn't seem like we had a lot to worry about. So that's part of what made the song so resonant. But that's all very late 90s. There's another reason it's lasted decades after the sunshine of the late 90s flickered and died. And that is, it's just an amazingly written song. You get what you give might have the attitude of the 90s, but it has the sound of M.O.R. rock from the 70s. You know, Carole King, Todd Rundgren, ELO, Steely Dan. This is music for songwriting nerds, just acts you'll listen to just to admire the craft. And that's how I listen to this song too. This is a song for people who love chords and structures and hooks. You Get What You Give is a pretty lengthy five minutes, but it uses every second of it. It is not a repetitive song, and there is not one wasted moment. Alexander says he just kept trying to top himself, and he does. Every time you think the song's out of tricks, it adds a new one. Now say your 
There's a solo at just the right part for just the right length of time. And a little bass lick at just the right moment. Like here's the part where you can tell because the song should logically end here. Because it's already been going for a while. But then he adds that one part that just puts it over the top. And we got to talk about it because that's the part that got him in trouble. Health insurance with my flying FDA big bank is buying big computer crashes dining clone and well they multiply fashion shoes with back in hands and Courtney Love and Marilyn Manson you're all bitch run to your mansions come around we'll kick your ass in See again everyone's full of shit but the new radicals phonies you're all big fat phonies and none of these people are Kim Kardashian or anything. You can't just get away with calling them fakes. Like, in one line, he managed to piss off hipsters, teeny boppers, riot girls, and goths. That's a wide set of demographics to annoy. He did eventually apologize to Beck personally. Marilyn Manson threatened him back at one point. For all that I'm gushing about how much I and everyone else loves this song, I, I have met people who don't. I vehemently disagree, obviously, but I can see the angle, how it might come off as a little too self-impressed. Like calling Marilyn Manson a fake, what, what does that even mean? You mean that's not his real eye color? Or, or this silly video of the rebels running right on the mall. Take that, squares. Yeah, they smash up rich people's cars. Cause they're radicals. New radicals. Alexander has said that he wishes people would stop focusing on the celebrity parts of that verse and more on the fact that he called out the banks and the health insurance companies and the FDA, but, you know, we love our celebrity feuds. The whole idea behind this particular album is uh, the commercialization of uh, society where it's so out of control. That Listening to these interviews, I think he thinks this song is a lot more political than it actually is, you know. Maybe you've been brainwashed too. Wake up, kids, Wake up, sheeple! I mean, yes, there is the vibe of being pressured by society and its false idols like Hanson, but what's great about this song is that it's uplifting and it's about friendship and getting by and it has that big, soaring, spirit-lifting chorus. But threatening Hanson is not what ended his career. And you could have seen it coming if you had ever seen any video of them live. Always with that bucket hat pulled over his eyes. If you're a music artist and you don't show your eyes, it's for one reason. You don't want to be famous. This is a guy who may have sang about things being alright, but eventually the phoniness of the world took him down. Okay, so this is their second song, Someday We'll Know, and it's a slower one. It's got a little clever idea behind it, like Greg is singing about the reasons for a breakup as one of the great mysteries of the universe. We'll know why I okay, so the Achilles heel of the new Radicals is that Greg Alexander is not a great singer. Whatever happened to He's got a very squawky little yelp thing that he does. He made it work on You Get What You Give, but slow down the energy, let some of his weirder lyrics stand out a little more. Did the captain of the Titanic cry? Yeah, it does kind of hit a wrong note. I mean, I learned to love this song anyway after a few listens, but I can kind of see why it didn't catch on. But I'm not sure the public rejected it exactly. I can't tell if it really got a push. I'm not entirely clear on the timeline here, but it's possible that this song never had the chance to catch on. Because before the band even had time to register the first hit, Greg ended the project. You Get What You Give peaked in January of 1999. The band was over in July. It is probably the quickest that any band's career has stalled out. The band from That Thing You Do lasted longer than this. And why'd he end it? He didn't like it. He didn't see himself having another hit anytime soon. He didn't want to spend his life being in a lame one-hit wonder band. Look, it takes a certain kind of personality to be a successful artist in music. There is so much boring, stupid marketing stuff that has nothing to do with music. Record industry hacks interfering with your work because they think they know better than you. Touring sucks. Doing interviews sucks. If you've ever wondered why your favorite reality show winner suddenly disappears after the show, sometimes it's because they realized all they've won is a lifetime supply of bullshit and they opted out. That's what happened to Greg Alexander. 
So I suspect Alexander's increasing unwillingness to play the game might have killed this song. Someone must have believed in it though, because it pops up again in pop culture a couple years later. That dress in the fourth grade. Nice sweater. Thank you. So this is a walk to remember, the most Jesus-y of the Nicholas Sparks adaptations. And in this extremely Christian movie, all of a sudden, this song comes on. Uh, this isn't the new Radicals version. Mandy Moore sings it herself. Her and the guy from Switchfoot, if you remember them. And a different new Radical song also appears in the movie. We just can't get no. we just can't get no. This was three years after the band broke up. I don't know how these songs wound up in Nicholas Sparks' A Walk to Remember, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was Mandy Moore's idea because she turned out to have surprisingly sophisticated taste in music. A year after this movie, Hall & Oates also covers Someday We'll Know, as did the band America in 2011. This is so weird to me. I am not used to these failed follow-ups getting any attention after they flop. There are no covers of Dance the Kung Fu. For what it's worth, the album is good to great. The songs all have really long Fallout Boy-esque titles, and the album is fun and rambly, and the songs just go wherever Alexander feels like. If you like the early 90s eclectic dance rock stuff like World Party or The Happy Mondays, I recommend it. I can say this about it, it is definitely the New Radicals' best album. Well, Alexander said in his breakup press release that he wanted to work behind the scenes. He said he saw himself like Babyface, in that he's more of a producer and only occasionally an artist. So in that way, and I'm assuming zero others. The first thing he did was produce Breeze Bois' second album, but unfortunately it never got released. But except for that, the man did really well for himself. Yeah, that's one of his songs. And nowadays, Alexander is known as a real songwriter-songwriter. The label gave him what he calls a blank check to just write and write and he'd probably be like super acclaimed and famous if he'd been pickier about who sings his songs. But he would work with anybody. He's given songs to Justin Guarini, Sporty Spice, some guy who won a talent show in Australia. He's even worked with Hanson. Right. See, he did kick their ass with awesome songwriting. Most of his successful songs were hits in the UK, and you can always tell which ones are his. Like, he's got a real distinctive style. A lot of octave falsetto jumps, jazzy seventh chords. This one's my favorite, by the way. Sophie Ellis Bexter's Murder on the Dance Floor. Look it up, love it forever. And for what it's worth, Breeze Bois wrote a couple of hits too. Yeah, you might know this one. So uh, she did pretty well for herself also. The rest is still After a while, Alexander burnt out again and disappeared for a while, but he reunited with Breeze Bois to write a soundtrack album. That would be for the movie Begin Again, John Carney's not quite as beloved middle film between Once and Sing Street. It's pretty good. Personally, I think it was a mistake to give the musical climax of the movie to Adam Levine. Nor would I have let him try and find out if he can act, because he cannot. But I still think it's a pretty good movie, worth watching, and the music is excellent. And the two of them got an Oscar nomination for it. And for what it's worth, Alexander also says he has about 10 albums worth of new Radical songs. But who knows if any of them will ever see the light of day. It's hard to say they deserved more when Alexander didn't want more. Let's say that I, the fan, deserved more from this band, because they were really good. In an alternate universe where Alexander could handle the pressure, the New Radicals are, well, I don't know if they're successful exactly, but they're certainly critical darlings. Instead, You Get What You Give lives on as a song too good to be from a one-hit wonder, and yet also too good to not be from a one-hit wonder. You got it in one. You're never gonna beat it. Just go out on top. Now let's all dance. Oh.